Broadcast Center in Los Angeles. This is KCAL 9 News at 4. Hello, I'm Juan Fernandez. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sandra Mitchell. And for Lena Wynn, it is opening day at Dodger Stadium. The Dodgers just one game away from winning the World Series last season. So you can imagine the fans mm -hmm. are really excited to see the boys in blue. They sure are. The Dodgers will, of course, have their ace on the hill, Clayton Kershaw. Kershaw has started the last seven opening days for the Dodgers, and they've won all of them. All right, so let's get more yeah. on the 2018 edition of our Boys in Blue. KCAL 9 Sports Director Jim Hill ready for first pitch. Jim, we're just minutes away. Juan and Sandra, thank you very much. Perfect weather. It is absolutely incredible, and it's every Dodgers fan's dream. Opening day at Dodger Stadium and the Dodgers are defending National League Championship Chavez Ravine going against the San Francisco Giants and we've got a good one for you. As you just mentioned, uh, Clayton Kershaw will be on the mound for the Dodgers and moments ago we talked to Dodger manager Dave Roberts about what opening day really means. It's kind of a business as usual thing, business as usual mentality and not to take anything away from opening day because it's a special day in all of baseball without a doubt. Um, but the idea and the mindset to do whatever can, we can to win one game is kind of the blue collar in us, and I, I like that. Now, yesterday, former Dodger great Kirk Gibson signed seat number 88 in the right field pavilion. We all remember that spot where his pinch hit home run landed during the Dodgers 5-4 game one victory over the Oakland Athletics in the 1988 World Series. The price for that seat was raised this season, and the proceeds from each ticket will go to the Kurt Gibson Foundation for Parkinson's Research. And, of course, we'll have all the highlights and postgame interviews for you tonight on KCAL 9 and, of course, on CBS 2. Back to you in the studio. All now. right, Jim, can't wait for it. Thanks so much. Well, first pitch is just minutes away at 410. We continue our team coverage with KCAL 9's Lisa Siegel, who's at Dodger Stadium to set the scene for us. Lisa? It is so much fun here. There is so much excitement. Take a look. People are lining up to get into the game. The sold out crowd will not just be celebrating the boys in blue, but the Dodgers 60th anniversary here in L.A. <laughs> Music is playing. Yeah, let's go, Dodger! The fans are ready, and everyone showing their true colors. Are you decked out? Definitely. I am a huge Dodger fan. These veins bleed blue. blue. <laughs> Welcome home, welcome home. Yes, it's opening day for Dodger baseball as they take on the San Francisco Giants. Let's go, Dodgers! It's a family affair for the All Reds of Whittier. It's really exciting. We come every year, so we wouldn't miss it today, and especially bringing her today for the first day. Fans promise redemption after that nail butter of a World Series with the Astros. Coming up short in Game 7. This close, but yet so far away. But this year? We're going to do it. So what's up at the stadium in 2018? For one, prices on opening day, two upper deck seats, two Dodger dogs, a couple of beers and parking will run you about 150 bucks. Is it worth it? It's always, so worth it. Always, totally worth always, it, always yes. Plus, you could eat your heart out. Check out the chicken and waffle Sammy complete with candied bacon and maple syrup. Very delicious. The Cheeto Lote, roasted corn dusted with flaming hot Cheetos. Spicy. <laughs> and this decked out churro with ice cream and of course a cherry on top. For fans, a win today would be just that. Let's go Dodgers! Four is one, two, three, strike your And back here live, you can see it's the opening series again. People lined up. So much excitement, so many families, so many kids. Everyone, true blue today. Back to you. I've been out there before, and my goodness, it's one of the most exciting times to be there. Oh, right? it's so much mm -hmm. fun. All right, and they've got perfect weather out there at the mm -hmm. ballpark, too. Craig's here. The first so, look at the yeah, forecast. Yeah, so nice. Buy me Dodger some Blue, peanuts huh? and yeah, exactly. I've got it going. <laughs> I had it since yesterday. Did you plan it. <laughs> I planned it. I was ready for this. This is the big day. Uh, and you know, I just checked the temperature there. We got lots of sunshine everywhere. A little haze close to the coast, but temperature-wise, right along the game as they get ready, we're already in the 70s. About 73 degrees right now. Light wind out of the southwest at about three miles per hour. Not bad at all. That's pretty picture perfect. About seven o'clock as people are starting to head out. About that time, we're close to the end of the game. About 70 degrees. Winds out of the south. 
southwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. We have some 80s on the map right now. 80 in Ontario, 84 in San Bernardino, 81 in Riverside. Now, we've got this high pressure that's kept us warm for today and will be there tomorrow. A couple of systems just off over to the Pacific will give us some cooling as we go through this weekend. By the way, average for this time of year is 71. We hit 74 at downtown Los Angeles today. I'll have more on that weekend forecast coming up in just a bit. I'll send it back to you. All right, Craig, thanks. There is heartbreak that reaches from Huntington Beach to Las Vegas. Three teenagers visiting California for spring break were killed in a crash that police say was caused by a drunk driver. KCAL 9 Orange County reporter Michelle Julie live now at the trauma center where doctors are treating this teen who survived the crash. Michelle. Friends and family, Sandra, one state away, are praying that this teenager pulls through. He is the, the lone survivor in a violent car crash that happened this morning on PCH in Huntington Beach. The victims, all friends from one Las Vegas high school, were wrapping up their vacation. 17-year-old A.J. Rossi was due home in Las Vegas tonight from his spring break vacation, as Sister Ali says. But she got a horrifying call just before noon from the Orange County coroner with the news that AJ had been killed along with two high school friends in a fiery wreck in Huntington Beach. An alleged drunk driver in a second car has been arrested, according to police. What happened was absolutely tragic, and I'm hoping that the residents of Huntington Beach can kind of create somewhat of a memorial here. And, um, and you know, less people drink and drive and less people lose their lives because of this irresponsible 27-year-old. This mourner left flowers near the spot on Pacific Coast Highway and Magnolia, where a South Orange County woman identified as Bonnie Duarte was arrested. The mother of four is being held on suspicion of vehicular manslaughter and DUI authorities say. Duarte is accused of colliding with a carload of Las Vegas teenagers in this red Toyota. Officials say two boys and a girl were burned beyond recognition. Friends say a fourth teenager from Centennial High School in Las Vegas was taken to a trauma center. Once the collision occurred, the red vehicle then caught on fire and uh, one person was able to escape, but the other three in the vehicle are deceased. AJ Rossi's sister says that her brother was killed alongside his best friend, both of them seniors. AJ, as I said, was supposed to get back to Las Vegas tonight, and tomorrow he and his sister were going to enroll him in the College of Southern Nevada. That's the latest live in Orange. Back to you. Just awful. All right, Michelle, thank you. A woman is in jail this afternoon accused of stabbing three people at a North Hills convenience store. It happened at the 7-Eleven on Sepulveda Boulevard around 8 this morning. Police say the woman stabbed three people with a pocket knife when an employee asked her to leave the store. Officers say after the stabbing, the suspect stole some items and took off. Police later arrested her. They say she has mental illness and is known to cause trouble at the store in the past. The victims are expected to be okay. The woman accusing Ryan Seacrest of sexual misconduct wrote an article in The Hollywood Reporter today, and in it she reveals that she has filed a police report with the LAPD. Her name's Susie Hardy, and she says she was Seacrest's personal stylist from 2007 to 2012. Hardy told the E! Network about her claims of misconduct while working with Seacrest on E! News shows. E! <coughs> investigated but said there was not enough evidence, and the network cleared Seacrest. In the article, Hardy claims several networks are protecting Ryan Seacrest because he is a, quote, cash cow for them. The LAPD confirms that Hardy's filed a police report. Ryan Seacrest attorney told The Hollywood Reporter his client will cooperate with an investigation. A federal judge in Los Angeles has denied a motion to depose President Trump about hush money paid to adult film star Stormy Daniels. Daniels, whose real name is Stephanie Clifford, has been seeking to invalidate a non-disclosure agreement she signed days before the 2016 presidential election. Daniels wants to be able to talk about her claim of having a sexual encounter with President Trump. The White House says Trump denies having an affair. Daniels attorney says he will eventually refile the request. Well, President Trump is saying goodbye to one of his closest White House advisors. Today was Hope Hicks' last day in the West Wing. Just last month, she announced she was resigning as communications director. KCAL 9's Hannah Doba looks at the possible impact from her departure. President Trump bid farewell to his outgoing communications director, Hope Hicks, Thursday, shortly before leaving the Oval Office for Ohio. 
The 29-year-old who once worked for Ivanka Trump played a key role in the president's campaign. He created a new position for her at the White House. Then she took over as communications director last summer. Hope Hicks, the legendary Hope Hicks. Sources inside the White House tell CBS News Mr. Trump relied heavily on Hicks' counsel over the past three years, bouncing ideas off her at all times of the day. They say she was able to do what few others could, corral and quiet a temperamental president. It's going to be very difficult to replace Hope Hicks in the Hope role, which was a very multidimensional role over the course of three years. Hicks, who resigned last month, is among nearly two dozen officials who have left the Trump administration. Earlier this year, she came under scrutiny for helping craft former White House Staff Secretary Rob Porter's response to spousal abuse accusations. So no comment at all? Hicks proximity to the president also put her in the sights of congressional investigators and special counsel Robert Mueller. The president hasn't named a replacement for Hicks, but counselor Kellyanne Conway is likely to become interim communications director. Hanadoba, the White House. Secretary of Defense James Mattis was caught on audio today welcoming newly appointed National Security Advisor John Bolton to the Pentagon with a joke about Bolton's reputation. Ambassador Bolton, Mr. Secretary, it's so good, good to, to see you. Thank you for thanks inviting me for, over. Oh, no. You. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming and uh, it's good to finally meet you. Absolutely. I've heard that you're absolutely the devil in Canada. I wanted to meet you. <laughs> I think you may have heard it there, Mattis, calling Bolton the devil incarnate. Mattis shot down reports earlier in the week that he and Bolton might have a tough time working together, saying he has no reservations or concerns at all with Bolton. Russia retaliates. The government now is expelling 60 U.S. diplomats and closing the American embassy in St. Petersburg. The Russian foreign minister said the measures against the U.S. include the expulsion of the same number of diplomats as Russians ordered out by President Donald Trump. Other countries that recently kicked out Russian diplomats also are facing retaliation. The Russians were expelled because of evidence that could link the Russians to a nerve gas attack on a former spy and his daughter. Well, the daughter of that former Russian spy reportedly is getting better. Her doctors say she's responding well to treatments in the hospital, and she's been upgraded now from critical to stable condition. Her father, though, is still in critical condition. That nerve gas attack happened March 4th in England. Next year at four mourners gathered in a church in Sacramento to remember Stefan Clark killed in a controversial police shooting. Also a deadly mystery, this is Northern California, a car with a family of eight inside plunged off a cliff. And your next cup of coffee might come with something extra after a court ruling today.